Next up, we have a really exciting talk with Paul Scanlon, Group CTO of Huawei Carrier Business Technologies. Now, Paul has more than 30 years of experience in the telco industry, and I truly can think of no other person than to walk us through the newest kit on the block, our next generation of connectivity technology, 5G, and the immense potential it's going to unlock. So it's, hi, welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you again for being with us. Now, f could you give us a quick 30-second elevator pitch almost for the uninitiated? Exactly what are the benefits of 5G compared to what we have today? You know, the 30-second elevator pitch, that's very tough. 5G is a platform for transformation. Very simple. So if you're a current telecom operator, the first thing it does is it addresses the problem of operational efficiency and it gives new opportunities in what we call B2B business. So moving a telecom operator from uh, their B2C business, which is very traditional, mm -hmm. and giving them opportunities in B2B. The opportunities in B2B are probably significantly more in value terms than they are in B2C. And that's why you need 5G. Could you paint us a landscape of where we are actually right now globally in terms of 5G technology adoption and where we are in terms of readiness and final implementation? Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, the picture I is scanning. China last count is probably about a million, uh, about, a million about a million base stations. It's about a million base stations globally, and probably 90% of that is in China. Certainly more than 200, 220 ish million subscribers, B2C subscribers. Mm -hmm. If we were to paint the picture in terms of B2C to try and put it in perspective uh, and contrast it to B2B, in China, we've run about 5,000 use cases in B2B scenarios. So 220 million um, subscribers in 5G globally and about 5,000 um, use cases under pilot, under test or in commercial, commercial progress. So it sounds like China is definitely ahead of the game, right? With, with 90% of B2B adoption there. Of course, besides the fact that Huawei was, was born out of China, could, could you tell us why is it that other countries are lagging so much in its adoption? Has it got to do with readiness, infrastructural, systemic capabilities? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. The, I guess the first problem is that most telecom operators, the challenge is mindset. You know, they've been traditional in say, the last 30 years. They pay a license fee to the government for Spectrum, they build a tower, and they sell SIM cards, plus or minus. I don't mean any disrespect to the operators, but the tradition. I mean, I came from Telstra many years ago, so I do have some, some background in a real telco. So that's the, the first problem. They're used to doing business this way. Now, if we just look at what has China been doing, say, in the last five to 10 years, it's got a lot of challenges. So it's understood that it needs to use technology. And just now you had one of the colleagues there talking about AI. So AI, IoT, cloud, 5G. China understands that these are core technologies. And if they utilize these technologies, they can transform. They can transform their economy and they can transform industry. That, that's the, the, the target. So. What, what I see practically in China is that they, they try to do things more collaboratively. So we would bring a telecom operator like China Mobile or China Unicom or China Telecom together with, say, a, a, a strawberry farmer or a mine or a steel factory or a hospital together with a company like Huawei and maybe an application developer. And they bring them together to try and solve real problems. And so, you know, we sort of cook the soup. But... In the West, everything is done in a very different way. Um, you know, before we invest in 5G, we have to be very careful about what's the investment model and how we get the subscribers, rather than thinking, well, if the spectrum was free or very cheap, and you incentivize the telecom operators to not roll out services, 5G services for handsets to 90% of the country within three years, but instead you turned around and said, I want you to transform the manufacturing industry to improve predictive maintenance or introduce augmented reality, or I want you to do more um, remote patient monitoring in healthcare, or I want you to connect all the transport infrastructure in Singapore, for example. Yes, so I can have autonomous cars and I can reduce pollution, yes, improving logistics. That's a very different target 
for an operator to, to move up against compared with the traditional one of build towers outdoor. So you can see there's lots of opportunities. 1% improvement in um, predictive maintenance in manufacturing, for example, will improve about 150 billion US dollars globally per year, per year. If you want to save a billion lives in 10 years, you need, you need 5G, but you can't do it if the ambulances can't be connected or you can't have high definition video as a practical uh, solution to your home or to remote areas, just as an example. If, if you have drop calls on a road or you don't have high speed and low latency on the roads, you can't have a connected ambulance to try and build, develop those types of use cases. So lots of opportunity, but lots of challenges. Right, and thus, I liked how you talked about the emergency medical services and ambulances. As you said, this deviates quite a bit from traditional telco operators and their range of focus. So yes. that being said, what would it take to really speed up 5G adoption? Would it take more of a almost top-down concerted effort by the government to drive this? You know, it's but that's a very that's a very tricky question to answer. It's a combination of both. You, of course, you need the top down, but you always need the bottom up. But what, what do I mean by that? The first challenge is everybody talks about 5G, talks about speed. I haven't mentioned speed. They talk about latency and they talk about massive connections. Well, I painted a different picture. I said it's about a, a transformation opportunity, and that really means that the government needs to be educated in how can 5G be um, applied to develop economies or to develop industries and then transform them to benefit the economy. That, that's the first thing that needs to be done. Part of that program includes how do you deploy 5G? Yes. And then what are the concerns from an investment perspective? Yes, because if you charge too much for spectrum, there's less money to deploy. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you want to connect the roads to improve traffic and autonomous vehicles, you're not going to do that by having 70 meter towers or putting them on the top of, of buildings or HDB flats or, or, you know, the traditional ways we're doing it. You need all the lampposts connected. And that means they need to be 5G base stations. You need the appropriate spectrum and deployment. You need the right incentive. And that now comes down to the telecom operator. He needs to understand that his role is in transforming industry, not rolling out SIM cards. Right? That's, that's, the, that's why I say 5G is really, you know, how to do it. The first step is education. We need everybody to understand the real um, 5G, not all the hype that's being promoted everywhere. Right, so really two things. One, like you said, Paul, to really understand what 5G is about and its potential to transform industry, transform a country, transform the yes. way we connect, live, work, play, and even save lives, like you mentioned. Yes, correct, correct. Now, and it goes beyond that. You know, if you wanted to, we took agriculture, and just, just to give you another example of why 5G is so important, um, the speaker before me was talking about AI and some of the cautions and some of the opportunities. AI and your question was, we've always known about data. We've known about data for a long time. We've called it different things over the years. But if you need data, you need to collect the data. And that means you need lots of data points, data sources, and it needs to be real time, very accurate, yes? So today we can only use AI based on data that we can see. But what if we had data from a lot of different places? Example, infrastructure on the, on the, on the transport systems. Let's have cameras, not looking at cars, but cameras looking at the road surface. Now the cameras are doing the surveys of all the roads. Yes. So now we know when to plan the maintenance for the roads, for the potholes or to improvements and things like this. Yes. A completely different thinking to connecting cars to look at other cars, etc. Just, just as an example. Yes. Let's suppose we wanted to take um, a very futuristic example where we don't need any traffic lights at all. And I'll paint the scenario this way. You're ready to leave the office and I'm ready to leave the office. But my, my watch or my smartphone or my uh, sensor in my eye tells my brain, sorry, Paul, you don't need to leave now. You can leave in three minutes because your car is parked in B3 and you've already told me that you want to go home and I know the best route for you, and I know all the other people who are about to leave the same building and where they're all going, okay? So I know the behavior. 
and now I can interweave when is the appropriate time for me to catch the elevator, use the steps to go to which level, to collect my car, et cetera, et cetera, and which way to go home. Now we come out onto the street and you want to cross the road, but there's only one person who wants to cross the road and there's 20 cars. So naturally it will tell you to stop, or it may say, turn left, walk around the corner, you're gonna cross in hundred meters because I know in three minutes by the time you walk there, there'll be five cars and there'll be hundred people. So therefore I'll stop the cars and allow you to travel across the road. So the only way these things can happen is if we have data coming from objects, things, and from people. We're doing this collaborative analysis between people, people and things, and things and things. And the only way we can get so much data at scale in real time from these various objects and people is if we have infrastructure like 5G powering it, of course. Yes. Yeah. I love so that example. It's one of the components, you know, narrowband IoT is another one, but these are, you know, 5G does it better. Yeah? It's more secure. We don't talk about security the right way in 5G, yes? It's always, it's had a negative, um, I guess, influence. So, but if we talk at the positive one, 5G is extremely secure, far more secure than all the other wireless technologies. So you can, you can deploy networks, you can deploy scenarios for people, with privacy of data, you can deploy scenarios with objects and things with with security, with confidence. Yeah, sorry, I was I was just moving on because I liked how you talked about that example because it helps us really see even from an individual level how lives we can save minutes and optimize our own lifestyles. Taking yes. it a level higher. Now, what innovative new business models do you think 5G technology can present specifically for the realm of future mobility? Now, we heard a lot from Guoping and Ken Hu about well, unlocking 5G to unlock new business potential and success. Tell us yes. more about yeah. that. All right. So we've been exploring a lot with industry, how to transform industries using uh, three or four core technologies. One is 5G for the connectivity, putting everything into a cloud, including AI, using advanced AI. A lot of the AI work has been uh, video-based or image-based or audio-based files. So let me give you some examples of those. I've mentioned already about manufacturing, predictive maintenance. Well, people might think I'm always going to use sensors everywhere. But you can put cameras and cameras can look at all the inventory. I mean, you can have a, a warehouse and the warehouse will have hundreds of thousands or millions of things in it. You could have a robot running around and counting things or looking for things and you know, robots cost this much and take some time to charge and recharge and watch out for people, etc. But you could use cameras. You could use a 4K camera connected via 5G or the camera can have an AI built into it and it can identify everything within the warehouse. So that means it could track everything coming in. Who delivered it? Does it come from a credible source? For example, has it been packaged properly? Has it been certified appropriately? And then it moves on to the next place, just one part of the manufacturing program, yes? Before we start talking, say, at a port or a mine or a steel factory, where we might be using cameras to do real-time remote control, where the cameras themselves are not just looking at things, but they're, they're deciding on whether there are humans there wearing safety gear, whether the humans there, we should move the crane or shouldn't move the crane. So the scenarios are significant. There's a large number of them. In Malaysia, we're using cameras to look at chilies, okay, dried chilies. I think you'll know it very well in Singapore, right? It's, it's a favorite delicacy of ours. So, so what happens? We just bring a chili and take multiple pictures of it. Good chili, good chili, bad chili. Now the AI knows the difference. And on the conveyor belt, a camera is looking and saying, good chili, good chili, good chili, bad chili, good chili, good chili, bad. We improve productivity, we improve the quality. Yeah. The health examples I, I've given you already, some of them high definition, a video based consultation. So video is terribly important. We're using high definition video now, but we're using probably 4G. And if children are in the next room, for example, playing video games, we can't control the quality. If that was in a manufacturing plant, we wouldn't want the same problem. If that was in a healthcare system, we wouldn't want the same problem. And that's why 5G does these things better than 4G. And that's why they're so important. So it really sounds like 5G is almost that enabler that would allow us to use some of these higher tech devices to help us to achieve those efficiencies that you were talking about, whether it's in a healthcare setting or in a factory setting, 
or whether yeah. a little bit combining with what our previous speaker was talking about, using AI to help us detect irregularities more effectively as well. Yes, in fact, that's a that's a good way to put it. It's um, it's about efficiency. It's about efficiency and quality. We we learnt it really, I guess, a year or so ago when we were looking at chest X-rays during COVID. Yes, we built a you know as you know. The China story, they built a couple of hospitals in 10 days. Well, Huawei built 5G networks in, in three days in the hospitals. And then we deployed cloud-based AI solutions in a couple of weeks. So you can imagine that the bottleneck is always the expert trying to look at the data, yes? So what the AI component does is it allows this to happen more quickly and probably more accurately once we've trained it appropriately. So how do you do those two components? You need a lot of data to train it, and then you need real time, large amounts of data to be processed quickly, captured quickly, uploaded, analyzed. These three components can't work without any one of them not being not being available. And I keep coming back to image and video. Your colleague before was also talking about uh, other examples of uh, using AI to recognize ailments, yes, in, in animals. So we use 5G to look at parasites, for example, on fish. Yes, that's because we can improve the yield. Yes, that's right. A 4K camera can can see this. So we're using these types of things to improve productivity, improve yield, improve quality. Yeah. Um, I had another good example which just escaped me, but carry on and it'll probably come to me in a moment. <laughs> no worries, it gives you some time to think about that. Let's get to one of our audience questions from YH. Sure. So what is Huawei doing to capitalize on the future mobility landscape in Singapore? All right. Look, um, there's obviously a number of different operators in Singapore and they, they pick different vendors to do different types of things, yes? And Huawei has a number of different business units. So some of the business units are responsible purely for connectivity, like 4 and 5G. They provide the, the connection within the country. And you, you understand that because that's largely driven by, by the smartphone. Yes. The second component are the devices, whether the devices are a fixed broadband device in your home, whether the devices are a mobile broadband device, whether it's 4 or 5G, or whether it's an IoT-related device that might be used in an industry or even in, in personal areas. Then you have enterprise-based solutions, which can use a range of connectivity solutions together with cloud-based AI solutions. So all of these products are available in, in pretty much every country that Huawei has, um, that Huawei has launched. But uh, as you heard from Ken Hu and also from uh, Wu Ping, Huawei is trying now because the world understands 5G finally. Yes, it's cheaper more operationally efficient. So there's a lot of good reasons to deploy it. But what's needed now is the help in how do we take it to market for business? And that's really where Huawei is trying to focus this year. Well, Paul, interestingly, you just mentioned that the world has finally reached a point where we understand 5G. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> in fact, well, they understand to deploy it, but they're deploying it, as I mentioned, they're deploying it largely for B2C. So the point I was making is, they understand that it's efficient, operationally efficient, yes? So the operation compared with the CapEx, OpEx, CapEx, um, they figured out how to do it. It also, I mentioned transforms. You can have an opportunity to build the network in a different way, lampposts instead of classic structures, which means the costs come down. The deployment can be done more quickly. So those components are understood. The challenge is the B2B bit. Yeah, it's interesting because this question covers both the B2B and the B2C bit. How do we help businesses and even consumers understand the links between the different technological advances like 5G, AI, cloud computing? How can, you know, I know you've been trying to do that for the last 20 minutes, but how can yes. you make these concepts real and easily comprehensible to them? Yeah, uh, I keep coming back to how to do it, right? Education, collaboration and incubation. So what my team has been doing, what Huawei has been trying to do is a combination of these three. You, you need the education program, but sometimes just talking about it isn't enough. What's really required is to bring a, a group of people, a group of companies together, and then to prove it. I call it a, an incubator rather than a proof of concept. I call it incubation, because then you can bring different industry players or different consumers to come in and try it and feel it and see the differences, yes? Then you won't fear it because you think that there's something wrong, you will also put it in perspective a bit better about how is it doing those things. And I think Singapore is a good market for this. 
It's well educated. Um, the operators are doing a good job in de deployment, etc. So the technology is there. You have AI-based companies in in, uh, in Singapore as well, and you have companies like Huawei with, in, uh, with all the technology. And the government does have incubation programs through different uh, different uh, different vessels. And I think those are the ways, the better ways, to promote the benefits of 5G, AI, and cloud. So really, as they say, seeing is believing. So we look forward to seeing some of these incubation experiments with our own eyes as businesses as well as consumers. But I hear you. I think my biggest takeaway from us, from you today, Paul, is really, yes, it's 5G. People think of it as the basic infrastructure. But what you were saying is that for things like AI, 4K cameras, you know, machine learning to help make our lives more efficient, that really cannot take place at real time the way we want to without having the connectivity that 5G offers us. Correct. And hopefully that kind of makes it clear to people like myself who are lay people on the other side of the screen. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been such a pleasure. I wish we had more time together. But thank you so much. And I hope that when the borders open, we'll see you in Singapore as well, running some of your incubations for us. We will. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day ahead, Paul. Thank you. Bye-bye.